the progression of the Brahma Viharas and different ways of practicing them. And slowly, at your own pace, you can simply incline your mind to listening to the Dhamma. And this is a sutta called Mitta Sahagata Sutta. Translated it as filled with love or loving kindness. But uh, Sahagata also can be uh, translated as accompanied or followed with loving kindness. And this is a bit how the Buddha explains how to practice in different ways with the Brahma Viharas uh, filled with each of the Brahma Viharas, whether it is using or understanding the progress or how to work with the seven supports of awakening directly in our practice, or um, this kind of mental balance, this equanimity that can be developed through uh, fourfold uh, practice that is called the patikula apatikula, the, which is usually called repulsiveness, uh, the repulsive and the unrepulsive. But uh, I've changed it up here a little bit so it's more adaptable to our context here and so it begins this is with the Kolyans in a small Kolyan village named Alidawasana this is another name for that sutta Alidawasana sutta then in the morning many monks took their bowls and robes and went to Halidawasana for alms. Then it occurred to these monks, it is very early to go far to go for alms in Alidawasana. Perhaps we could visit the ashram of the wanderers of different teachings. See what they have to say. There is no Facebook at that time, so at that time is, you have to go to the ashram next door. <laughs> and arriving there, the wanderers all gathered to greet them. And after having rejoiced and been welcomed, they sat down together. The wanderers of different tradition asked, Friends, the Samana Gotama teaches Dhamma to his followers saying, Come monks, let go of the five hindrances, the impurities of the mind that impair conscious discernment or wisdom. This is the inability to see the Four Noble Truths, the awakened understandings. Meditate with a heart filled with love, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, a fourth, above, below, and everywhere across, to all that is, all living beings in this boundless universe. Meditate with a heart filled with love, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. Meditate with a heart filled with compassion, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth, above, below, and everywhere across, to all that is, all living beings, in this boundless universe. Meditate with a heart filled with compassion, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. See, I try to really stay close to this in the guided meditation, perhaps you've noticed. 
Meditate with a heart filled with joy and meditate with a heart filled with calm or this is usually translated as equanimity. I translate usually upeka when it is used as the last of the seven supports of awakening. I translate it as steadiness of mind because it feels closer to the actual Pali meaning. But when it is used as a Brahma Vihara, um, my understanding is that calm, radiant calm, is closer to what the idea is here. And um, this is the intricacy of finding the right English words for the Pali, because the Pali is a language where words have very many different meanings to them, and they are used in the very uh, broad uh, spectrums of uh, meanings. And to bridge the two, the English and the Pali, is not always uh, possible using the same words all the time. So this is one of the situations. And I mention this because this fourth Brahma Vihara here, Upeka, which I translate as calm, uh, comes back here later in the Sutta as the seventh of the supports of awakening, which is also Upeka. But at this point I call it steadiness of mind. But just so you know, uh, the Pali here is the same as Upeka. We also, friends, teach our students in this way, saying, Come, monks, let go of the five hindrances, the impurities of the mind that impair conscious discernment. Meditate with a heart filled with love, with a heart filled with compassion, filled with joy, and filled with calm. And he goes through the same sequence vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. Here, friends, there is no difference, no distinction between other samanas and the Gotama's discourses, teachings and instructions. When this was said, the monks neither rejoiced nor reproved. They stood up and left, thinking, We shall learn the proper answer for this in the presence of the Buddha. And this happens sometimes uh, between different teachings and different uh, practices, when uh, sometimes we might encounter some... Uh, some people who might think that uh, some, some things are uh, similar or um, that's how they practice as well. But not knowing, in fact, the entirety of this practice and therefore um, creating some confusion sometimes. And so that's why this sutta is quite wonderful for this. The Buddha explains this very well. Then the monks went to Halidavasana for alms. Later in the afternoon, after alms round, they went to the awakened one, paid loving respects, and sat down in front of him sa and said, Hear Bhante, and they reported everything that happened. Then the Buddha said, Monks, when this is said by wanderers of other traditions, you should ask them, how is the liberation of the heart by love developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? And what is its culmination? It's getting a little tricky now. How is the liberation of the heart by compassion developed? How is the liberation of the heart by joy developed? 
How is the liberation of the heart by calm developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? And what is its culmination? So now we can see if really this is the same thing we are talking about. Asked in such a way, monks, practitioners from other teachings will be unable to proceed further and they will most likely be at a loss. <laughs> or maybe not, but uh, this is what the situation is here. Because, monks, it is not their field, not their domain. Monks, I see nobody in this world of devas and maras and brahmas, of samanas and brahmanas, this era of kings and people, who could satisfy a person's mind by answering this, other than the truth finder, or one of his disciples, or one who has heard it from them? How is the liberation of the heart by love developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? What is its culmination? Here, monks, one develops the awakening support of awareness filled with love, supported by letting go, calming down, release, and culminating in relaxation. Now, this is not falling asleep relaxation. This is Wosaga. This is sometimes translated as release, which is good also. Or sometimes it can be translated as surrender. But this is this famous sequence where the Buddha explained a lot of things in this way, especially the seven supports of awakening or the eight-spoke path. He said that each spoke or each support was supported by letting go, which is viveka here calming down, viraga, and release, niroda. And here it is quite explicit where the Buddha is going um, because this is not any kind of awareness. This is not any kind of development that is properly developed so that it is developed in the same way that the Buddha taught. Now we need to understand the importance of viveka, letting go, detaching, detaching the mind. So this is not about l attaching love to something. In fact, it is freeing it. It is detaching it so it is completely liberated. And so, at the same time, so is the mind. And so this is the differentiation between wrong mindfulness and right mindfulness, or unwise mindfulness awareness, or unwise awareness. This viveka is also here, in this particular sutta, there is no mention of jhana per se, but it is taking a different form here. Now, viveka is the first jhana. It is the detachment, letting go. And so it is not by... See, when we speak of joy and we say that sometimes it can be tricky when we explain the first jhana with the joy. There is a joy arising and then People may think, oh, it's any kind of joy now. But no, that's not any kind of joy is the first meditation. This is viveka jang piti sukkang. But this is also vivichewa kamehi vivichewa kusalehi dhammehi. That means letting go of sensory stimulation. So this is the joy that arises in the mind, mental joy, 
from letting go of all these distractions outwardly. And calming down viraga, and this is, well, first viveka is often, um, most often translated as seclusion, which is also good and true, but not only and uh, strictly limited to this. This is um, seclusion of the mind, yes, and how does seclusion happen is by letting go, this act of viveka. And this calming down, viraga, is often, very often, translated as this passion. And this is a problem one, because um, this tends to be interpreted in a way that one needs to be dispassionate. Which is not completely wrong but not completely right in the Western context and the Western understanding of things. Being dispassionate in the Western context is a bit like having no hopes, having no faith, having no energy to do anything, no willpower, no drive. And that is definitely not the Buddha's teaching. And so we need to be careful about these terms that are being used. And here, viraga, which is something that not everybody knows, can also be translated as calming down, also fading away. And here, we see that it's only a matter of really understanding a few Pali terms a little better and understanding their alternative translation, perhaps, to understand a little bit more about what the Buddha actually uh, taught. And this is not a path of uh, being lazy and completely dull in mind and having no faith at all and no energy, that dispassion. It is, in fact, and this is also from very old English, that passion which now would be more uh, closer to agitation, mental agitation, or this craving, but even this word is a word I try to avoid. And niroda, which is often translated as cessation, which is true, it can be true in many ways, but it is not strictly, again, uh, only reserved for uh, cessation. This, is also, this can also mean release and uh, unobstruction, in fact. We can also see this as bringing things to an end calming them down, but this is basically calming down the mind, just another way of saying it. And which these three culminate in relaxation, in surrender, in vosaga. And why I'm taking a little bit of time here to explain these, because they come back very often in this sutta, and uh, they come back very often in the Buddha's teaching um, itself, and it's quite imp it's quite important, in fact, to to know this because they're going to come back quite often. And if we miss the right understanding about them from the beginning, then it becomes uh, it becomes misleading sometimes. And so we begin here with the first support of awakening, which is awareness, filled with love. And if you remember in the Yanapanasati Sutta, he explains the supports of awakening as 
beginning with the resting places of awareness and from there from let's say resting awareness on whatever is felt feeling or sensations n only knowing them as sensations letting go of distractions and tension the mind settles down and awareness springs up and it's the same thing here for the loving kindness when we do practice the way that it was said just earlier awareness arises on its own because it's the nature of this wholesome state to be aware therefore there is the birth of this awareness and this is the beginning One develops the awakening support of discernment. This is also known as investigation, but this is sorting out, sorting out the states. Unwholesome and wholesome. Filled with love. Supported by letting go, calming down, release, and culminating in relaxation. One develops the awakening support of inspiration or determination or energy filled with love, supported by letting go, calming down, release, and culminating in relaxation. One develops the awakening support of joy filled with love. See these states, they, they come together too. They can be <laughs> together. And they are together. Supported by letting go, calming down, release, and culminating in relaxation. See here he's showing us the way that awareness goes through by this path of practice. Constantly letting go, calming down. And here the first three are basically wise awareness, wise practice, and um, wise understanding, these three states, these three spokes of the Eightfold Path that turn together, always, they always come together. We need awareness for discernment and we need discernment to tell the states apart and we need the effort, the action to do let go of the unwholesome and to bring up the wholesome state and this creates awareness in itself and then this awareness feeds discernment the discernment is used in the action and the action blooms into awareness and so this is the the three first steps here are the active steps in the seven supports of awakening and they bloom into joy now the loving kindness has quite a bit of joy in it anyways and so we and by smiling also it we directly go to that fourth <laughs> support of awakening so we don't have to worry too much but um, here the next the following three are what are the more passive is the more passive part of the seven supports where this is simply what happens when we've practiced the first three or four supports properly one develops the awakening support of calm filled with love supported by letting go and this is this is tranquility pasadi uh, this is not the same calm as the equanimity before not that it is completely different, but I just wanted to point it out. Calming down, release, and culminating in relaxation. One develops the awakening support of mental collectedness, filled with love, supported by letting go, calming down, release, culminating in relaxation. One develops the awakening support of steadiness of mind, Filled with love, supported by letting go, calming down, release, culminate, and culminating in relaxation. And see these, as we are 
choosing constantly. Um, Delson calls it this effective choice, this wise intention. The choosing the loving kindness, choosing the wholesome in our practice constantly. And as we practice this wholesome, boundless love, these seven supports of awakening simply arise on their own. Now they're broken down, but uh, as we keep this love uh, and completely open, these seven supports of awakening simply arise. And they are accompanied with this love. One trains, let me live unattached to what is favorable. One then lives unattached to that. Then one trains, let me live accepting what is unfavorable. One then lives accepting that. One then trains, let me live unattached to both favorable and unfavorable. One then lives unattached to that. One then trains, let me live accepting both favorable and unfavorable. One then lives accepting that. One trains, having discarded both the favorable and the unfavorable, let me live calm, present, and fully conscious. Calm, one then meditates, present, and fully conscious. One meditates, having arrived at the liberation of the beautiful. Monks, I say that the liberation of the heart by love has the beautiful as its limit. Here for a wise monk who has not discerned a higher liberation, or anybody, not necessarily monks. And here we have this uh, sequence where the Buddha takes this practice even further. Now we take this determination to train with this love and whatever happens in our experience, whether it is pleasant, and this is that patikula, being the unrepulsed by the repulsive and repulsed by the unrepulsive. This is how it's usually translated. But um, here it is simply about developing this balance of mind in all situations. And the thing that can happen also, that is one of the, the things with uh, boundless love and these Brahma Viharas when we practice them, one of the wrong ways of practicing it, for example, is that we, someone could start attaching a person, a situation, or anything. That's how uh, clinging works, it's attaching <laughs> something. And um, whatever that particular thing is, then the Buddha says that there is this possibility uh, when we practice this, when we practice this love, for example, we could start being creating some attachment for a certain situation. And now he's saying we have to go beyond this, cultivate this love, this boundless love, but completely devoid of any condition, devoid of any kind of attachment or clinging or opinions. And whether what is happening to us at that time is pleasant we're not clinging to it. We learn to detach the mind from it and see it as it actually is. This is, this is a pleasant situation. Great. But allowing it to be also. When an unpleasant situation arises, then with carrying that love, we remain 
steady in the love. We don't we we practice not pushing it away and understanding it with wisdom, with discernment. This is simply an unpleasant, unfavorable situation that arose through causes and condition. This moment was ripe for it to come up. The causes and condition lined up and it grew. And now this is happening. This is not personal. This is not something that we choose. Therefore, why creating a fuss about it or taking it personally or becoming agitated because in the end we didn't choose it to happen. And so in all situations, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant, to remain unattached and to also to not push away these things. So it's simply another interesting approach. And here we can also see that the Buddha is also explaining a little bit about the jhanas simply in a different manner. He, he begins with this not being attached to what is favorable or attractive. And this is very much related to the sense, sensory uh, longing, sensory stimulation that we tend to uh, lean towards as favorable and to not, not to be detached from it. And this is another angle of viveka. This is another angle of letting it go. And then not to be um, repulsed by whatever unpleasant situation arises. Well, this is also letting go of these unwholesome states. When we're repulsed, that means that, means that is the anger. That is the not liking. That is the pushing away. And therefore, these, uh, by definition, come into that category of the second aspect of the first jhana, which is vivicce wa akusalehi dhamme, unwholesome, unwholesome mental states, letting go of that. So here, see how the Buddha is using completely different words, but explaining the same kind of principles. And he moves along into developing that steadiness of mind, that calm, where one is present and fully conscious. Not fully conscious of focusing on one thing, fully conscious of this whole experience, of this love, this boundless love, flourishing, blossoming. And he then, after explaining this, which is an interesting way of describing the jhanas, simply in another way, he says, one meditates, having arrived at the liberation of the beautiful. This is Subha. And this is another way that he had of explaining the fourth jhana, the fourth level of meditation. He often called it the beautiful. And this is mostly seen in the Vimokas, the unbindings or the liberations of the mind, the eight liberations. And uh, this beautiful is, is translated as the beautiful, which is quite, quite nice. But it also means uh, pleasant, agreeable. Uh, most translators, I believe, probably lean towards that word, and I did also, uh, the beautiful, because it's quite attractive to call the fourth jhana like this. But it doesn't strictly mean beautiful. <laughs> it also means what is pleasant, what is agreeable, what is desirable. And the that is quite a, an accurate description of the fourth jhana. 
and where there is this really wonderful bliss of a steady, steady mind. And in the third jhana, there is this description where, where the, the Buddha says, uh, a state which the Aryas, the awakened people, describe as steady presence of mind. This is a pleasant abiding. Well, this is the description of that Subha, that beautiful. Because this is the culmination. This is even better than the first two jhanas, than the first three jhanas, is that equanimity that we have developed through joy, through letting go. And it is very, very blissful. Not coarse, very subtle, but very steady. And this is why at this point he says, this is the pleasant abiding of the Aryas. Because we need to experience this to understand how, how good it is. How, and it's not at all impossible. It is very uh, possible. Um, but this is what the Buddha means here as the, this beautiful uh, state. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to be as long as this with each of them. <laughs> and um, this was the first one. The other four Brahma Viharas will be quite, um, quite uh, shorter because now I've done all the talking. So, <laughs> How is the liberation of the heart by compassion developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? What is its culmination? Here, monks, one develops the awakening support of awareness filled with compassion, supported by letting go, calming down, release, and culminating in relaxation. One develops the awakening support of discernment filled with compassion, the awakening support of inspiration or determination filled with compassion. The awakening support of joy filled with compassion. The awakening support of calm filled with compassion, tranquility. The awakening support of mental collectedness filled with compassion. The awakening support of steadiness of mind filled with compassion. Supported by letting go, calming down, release, culminating in relaxation. See here how this, this letting go, calming down, release, and relaxation, this will lead us all the way to Niroda, to cessation, to Nibbana. One trains, let me live unattached to what is favorable. Let me live accepting what is unfavorable. Let me live unattached to both favorable and unfavorable. Having this, let me live accepting both favorable and unfavorable. And see, in this way, balance of mind becomes unshakable. And this is, in fact, another way that the Buddha had, had to describe the fourth level of meditation, the fourth jhana and beyond in the Arupa jhanas, the imperturbable Ananjaya. And the Subha and the, the imperturbable are simply other ways that the Buddha had to explain his teaching of the fourth jhana for the beautiful and beyond for the imperturbable. Having discarded both the favorable and unfavorable, let me live calm, present, and fully conscious. Having entirely gone beyond all perception of form or materiality of this body, with the awareness of sensory impact fading away, turning away from the awareness of plurality. This simply means the mind becomes very collected and that becomes the main 
experience of the mind, not so much of the body anymore. Knowing there is endless space, one understands and abides in the plane of endless space. Monks, I say that the liberation of the heart by compassion has the plane of endless spaciousness as its limit. Now see here how now we're getting to see that each of these Brahma Viharas land or end up in a different place. And this is due to their um, nature. And the way I find is easy to describe this is that this, this love is simply is quite strong. This love is, is very uh, outwardly uh, expressed. Whereas compassion is, it can be a little bit more subtle. It can be more detached. Usually the difference that will happen between love and compassion is when there is something unpleasant happening to somebody else or to ourselves. This is where that... Uh, Hurt is happening, dukkha, to not say that dreadful word of suffering, but um, not so much suffering, but when we see somebody else that is hurting, that is going through a hard time, or when we are hurting or having a hard time, something that is happening that is not very pleasant, then usually this is where that compassion starts. See, the difference is the love is just this outward goodwill, whereas that compassion has a different tone of accepting something that is difficult and having that compassion for your own happiness or the happiness of that particular being that is going through that thing. And since it is a little bit more detached, less involved and less uh, driven out, it is a little bit more subtle and therefore it is possible to experience this when awareness uh, is more mental where body awareness fades away after the fourth jhana and some people experience it as the feeling going up into the head but really um, this is simply meaning that the experience becomes more mental at this point and at this point there is no need like it is said here it is the spa the plane of endless spaciousness so there is already this openness r happening in all directions so we don't need to push or force this compassion to really go out simply having a compassionate mind at this point will naturally go out unless we impede it with a thought or a distraction but then when we let go we relax that distraction the mind lays back down into that plane and it acquires confidence and calm in that plane here for a wise monk who has not discerned a higher liberation how is the liberation of the heart by joy developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? What is its culmination? Here, monks, one develops the awakening factor of awareness filled with joy, of discernment filled with joy, of inspiration filled with joy, of joy filled with joy of calm filled with joy, of mental collectedness 
filled with joy. One develops the awakening support of steadiness of mind filled with joy. Supported by letting go, calming down, release and culminating in relaxation. One trains, let me live unattached to what is favorable. Let me live accepting what is unfavorable. Let me live unattached to both favorable and unfavorable. Let me live accepting both favorable and unfavorable. Having discarded both favorable and unfavorable, let me live calm, present and fully conscious. Having gone entirely beyond the plane of endless space, knowing there is endless consciousness. One understands and abides in this, in the plane of endless consciousness. Now joy is this, and it's important to know also that these, this is the limit of each of them, but it doesn't mean that only where they are we can practice those up to there that is what is meant here so the loving kindness is up to the fourth jhana then it becomes too coarse for the mind the compassion is all the way we can practice compassion all the way through all the the jhanas up to the plane of endless spaciousness and for joy, it is all the way from the first jhana, all the way through to the plane of endless consciousness. And at this point, the reason why it is so is simply that joy is very simple. It requires very little implication of or involvement of the mind, whereas love and compassion are fairly involved in this kind of well-wishing, well, goodwill, and uh, com compassionate for something else, whereas the joy is simply, that is the, also the realm of the Abhasara Devas, the, the plane of the radiant Devas that feed on radiant joy. And so this, this particular state is, is getting, and as we can see, it is getting simpler and simpler and simpler. And this joy is simply very simple. It is void of, of another, of, of, of this kind of... Uh, um, complication of uh, that is implied in the love and in the compassion the joy is simply a very simple state and it is also an awakening support so therefore um, it is it stays for quite a while and that is where I usually start speaking more about bliss rather than joy because it is not this excited kind of joy it is more this really steady bliss this really uh, delightful equanimity of mind calm of mind and the way that this happens is that Spaciousness will be left behind because it is um, it is a bit coarser. It is each of these states they are getting subtler and subtler and subtler. So this endless spaciousness is big, and it feels better than the fourth jhana, but it is more tensed than the endless consciousness where we let go of even this perception of endless spaciousness and there arises slowly simply this experience of that stream of consciousness which is constantly arising 
And this is more subtle. This is getting more and more subtle. We're getting to understand consciousness at the experiential level in the deeper stages of meditation. And this is where we will be able to have certain insights like that steady, that consciousness is not a permanent, unchanging thing. In, in fact, it is constantly arising and passing away, arising and passing away, arising and passing away. And that, in fact, we are not doing this. It is simply happening without me doing it. <laughs> and that is usually a profound insight on the na impersonal nature of existence, of reality. And so, and simply this means that it is simply a greater uh, level of release, a greater level of liberation because the mind stops taking everything like it's personal and it stops attaching everything to itself. This is me, this is mine. Now there is this really beautiful understanding that in fact this is simply happening and we really get to detach from it. We, we learn to let go even more. Now radiant calm. How is the liberation of the heart by calm developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? What is its culmination? Here monks one develops the awakening support of awareness filled with calm, of discernment filled with calm of inspiration filled with calm, of joy filled with calm, of steadiness filled with calm, supported by letting go, calming down, release and culminating in relaxation. One trains, let me live unattached to what is favorable, let me live accepting what is unfavorable, let me live unattached to both favorable and unfavorable. Let me live accepting both favorable and unfavorable. And th in this way, we become all around meditators. Nothing can, can disturb our meditation at this point, hopefully. Having discarded both the favorable and unfavorable, let me live calm, present and fully conscious. Having gone entirely beyond the plane of endless spaciousness, knowing there are no objects, one understands and abides in the plane of objectlessness, or without an object, without any features. Monks, I say that the liberation of the heart by calm has the plane of objectlessness as its limit. Here for a wise monk who has not discerned a higher liberation. And here, this is the plane that is usually called as nothingness. But this nothingness is sometimes misunderstood. Some, sometimes people mistake this, the spaciousness for the nothingness, the nothingness for the Spa the plane between awareness and its release or niroda itself, nibbana. So uh, nothingness can be a little tricky sometimes. And so this plane of objectlessness is, or featurelessness or without attribute particularly, this is where the, the meditation changes. This is where the meditation, here we've gone through all of the Brahma Viharas and we've seen that equanimity or radiant calm, radiant uh, boundless calm culminates, it ends in the plane of nothingness or objectlessness. And This is why the, the Buddha said that 
the Brahma Viharas do not go all the way to Nibbana. And this is where we need to step out of this wonderful vehicle if we want to continue further. Because otherwise we would be clinging to a particular object or vehicle. And clinging is not the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha's teaching is about not clinging. And so therefore here we step out of the Brahma Viharas and we step in to the end of the four resting places of awareness, the seeing mind as mind, resting the mind upon itself. And this is what this famous plane of nothingness is, it is this awareness of what? Nothing in particular. Just mind, aware of itself. And, but we're not very used to this. It's a very freeing thing of witnessing mind as it is simply witnessing itself. And of course, this does not happen with a slice of a knife. It's not a clean-cut transition where a second ago you were with this boundless calm and now everything changed and you're in this observing mind as mind. It is very subtle. Uh, but if we continue the practice, practicing properly with letting go, supported by letting go, calming down, uh, release, or bringing things to an end, and this is where Niroda starts to make a lot more sense for the advanced practice, is we are in fact bringing all of this to a complete release to an end. And this is where the word vosaga instead of relaxation can also be understood as surrender. See it is tricky translating the Pali because we don't have the same words for everything. So at this point here it is more about completely surrendering, completely letting go. And that means also, and this is where This, this sutta ends here, but uh, I will be uh, going beyond this a little bit. And as we step into the mind, seeing only mind as it is, simply mind, there's nothing particular arising. This is simply, it's a pretty is very clear awareness of nothing. But as discernment, so see here the, the awareness, the support of awakening of awareness that we've seen throughout this whole process. It's not because we stop the Brahma Viharas that the supports of awakening stop. In fact, these continue also here. Now the awareness has become very sharp. There's very little disturbance in the awareness, mind as mind. And so we are able to see things clearer and clearer. And here we see the distractions before they even arise. We start to see the beginning of the distractions, the beginning of the asawas, the beginning of the mental movements. And that is the second support of awakening, discernment, which is very sharp at that point. And then we continue, we find inspiration in that, of course, because it is, it reaps into joy and now we start to notice this. We know that it is, it is good, it leads to happiness, to a happy state here and now. 
This is getting more and more happy. Simply calm happy. <laughs> and now this is the fourth uh, support of awakening. That is the joy. But the joy here is more bliss. It's this really wonderful bliss of having this kind of clear mind is hard to put into words but the Buddha was very clear that this is even better than all these other states as we go and then this continues on into even more calming down now here what starts to happen is that vijnana consciousness starts to break down and we are getting to know and understand the very deeper aspects of the buddha's teaching awareness starts to break down into these what we call sankharas and these sankharas they are all of that mental activity that is conditioned it is arising on its own due to previous causes and condition and they arise they have a certain volition they have a certain velocity and we learn to calm this velocity we calm this force this is still same practice here but the tranquility becomes much uh, stronger in a way that is calm and samadhi becomes so sharp collectedness of mind becomes so sharp and steadiness so sharp and so present awareness becomes starts to dissolve it breaks down here and what happens when awareness starts breaking down well is that we're not that aware of it <laughs> and this is where the intricate part is because we only know this looking back at, and this is uh, in another sutta the Buddha explained this wise samadhi in five steps the first step was the first jhana the second jhana was the second step third step third jhana fourth step fourth jhana fifth step was pachavekana this means reflecting pachavekana is like a mirror looking back and telling these states that's why at the beginning our mind is full of hindrances it's hard to tell these states apart but as we get used to this meditation we look back we reflect on what was happening then we get to see these states a little clearer and then it makes more sense but at this very end part of the path when awareness starts being so clear it vanishes it it starts to fade away then sometimes the perceptions become coarse again and the sankharas coarser sankharas come up again because this is not a clean cut practice it will fluctuate or come back and down we just continue letting go letting go at this point it's only about just letting it all go letting it all go bringing it to an end completely releasing it and sometimes when coarser perceptions arise we will leave this deeper space and we can look back one can look back at what happened in that state the Buddha said one cannot know this plane between awareness and its limit or between awareness and its release neither perception or non-perception as it is called sometimes 
One is only aware of this plane when one comes out of it because there needs to be awareness to be aware of it and this is where it falls off so and this is very important to understand this part of the path and this deeper end of the practice because the Buddha did not only teach awareness in fact he taught the release from experiential awareness niroda and that is what is called nibbana and this is very important to understand so mindfulness is not just what the buddha taught there he taught to go beyond this so at this point we we have cultivated these seven awakening f supports to such an extent that they are become very sharp and as we are getting used to the plane between awareness and its release neither perception or non-perception the mind acquires stability in this it becomes used to that and that is kind of its dwelling place and as we learn to, when grosser perceptions arise, one looks back and understands what happened, the coarser perceptions arose again and lets them go again and acquires confidence and confidence. At some point, the mind, the thing is that in, in this space, there are still very, very subtle formations that arise but they're they're very 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 subtle we're not very aware of that one is not very aware of that so it is not complete niroda but as we learn to continue and having taken release as a foundation then it brings us there but we cannot bring anything into that space. So that's why the Brahma Viharas do not lead there. And then there is complete release of the mind. Uh, it is also translated as cessation, which is not wrong. But I prefer the term release, where awareness comes, in fact, with tension in it a little bit it's faint but these sankharas every one of them comes with that tiny tiny tension and when we learn to see that and to let it go then we go into that place that there is no tension at all and when we there is coming out of this uh, there are three kinds of contact, I believe they are emptiness contact, voidness contact, and undirected contact. So we, one experiences, the first thing that one experiences or that the mind touches coming out of this space, the contact here, is that there was absolutely nothing there was absolutely no self void of a self and that the mind was completely undirected therefore no object at all and that means no contact no mental contact because this is still a kind of support for the mind and we are letting go of all these supports that is the path to Nibbana <laughs> uh, so I hope that this was useful to you and uh, not too painful hopefully and uh, is there any question? I guess I this took a little bit longer. But uh, if there's any question.
Gunther, I just wanted to say beautiful, beautiful understanding. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Good, good. Okay. Everybody is knows what to do now. <laughs> I hope so. Good, good. Well, okay. So, I hope all of you have a wonderful week. Did you have a question, Terry? Sorry. Uh, no question. Okay, okay, good. I think... Um Continuity is obviously very important. Yes. Yes, very much. Good. Beautiful discourse, thank you. Okay, well, my pleasure. We can share our merits and then uh, let you go. <laughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.